I never spent an evening away from home. My drawing room became a spot so well known and so admired on account of the distinguished people who were to be found there that this mild social success aroused other animosities against me, even more to be dreaded than political enmities. Those of young women whose attacks were not limited to the field of politics. Monsieur de Fla oh, Monsieur de Labaudie. <laughs> yeah. Monsieur de Fla oh, Monsieur de la Bedoyer, Monsieur de la Tour Malbert, Monsieur de la Canouville, Monsieur de Lascour had been in the habit of going every evening to the house of Madame de Girardin. Madame Alfred de Noyai, one of the young women who had gone out to meet the Allies the day of the fall of Paris, also went there. She was agreeable, animated, and was one of the people who contributed the most to make these evenings a success. The sort of struggle that went on between the partisans of the different political parties gave a particularly spirited tone to the conversation. And since it is always awkward to declare oneself the enemy of a pretty woman, the discussions were just violent enough to be renewed the following day. Madame de Noyai had earnestly advised these gentlemen to let bygones be bygones and to make their peace with the new court party, but her efforts had been useless. They persisted in continuing the line of conduct they had already selected. She therefore no longer attempted to persuade them, but displayed her preference for the company of young men of promise, whom she even allowed to jest at her former old-fashioned friends, thus showing that she would rather quarrel than be bored. On my arrival from St. Louis, all these gentlemen, who with Messieurs de Ségur, Lavalette, de Broglie, Molien, and Molay, had always come to my receptions, and they returned to them immediately. This was doubtless the reason for which Madame Alfred de Noyai hated me cordially. I was constantly being made a target for her attacks. I am not confusing her with her cousin, Madame Juste de Noyai, who was always gentle and kind. Madame Alfred de Noyai, one day in her home, in the presence of a number of people that my house served as the headquarters for a group of extremely dangerous men. She added that I stimulated their ardor, that steps should be taken to guard against the result of their conspiring, that Monsieur de la Boudillere was an out-and-out Jacobin. In short, they all had something unpleasant said about them. They heard of this from one quarter or another, Monsieur de la Boudillere from his wife one of whose friends was present, and I from Monsieur Butiaguina, for members of foreign embassies were also present. My friends were furious that a young woman who had been brought up with me should try to do me such grave harm, disturb my peace of mind, and endanger the health of my children by taking advantage of the delicacy of my present position. This undue enmity provoked excessive partisanship, and I, desiring only to be left in peace, found myself between the upper and the nether millstone. How was I to put an end to the state of things? One day at a dinner given by Madame de Girardin, my young defenders agreed not to speak to Madame Alfred de Noyai. She demanded an explanation, which no one would give her. Thus, the situation became still more involved. I disapproved of this act of rudeness towards any woman. I said as much and continually tried to pour oil on the troubled waters. It was impossible to restore peace. There was moreover another reason for complaint against me. The Duchess de Mouchy, Madame de Noyai's mother, lived just across the street from me. She had a day on which she received her friends but only a few cabs and carriages ever drove up to her door, and these were obliged to make way for the considerably larger number of vehicles which stopped in front of my house. It was out of the question for her to continue to submit to such a superiority on my part, especially as one would have expected recent events to have done away with it. It seemed difficult to accept the fact that some little of the prestige of my former rank still remained, and that having in the past only been attached to my friends, they should not all have abandoned me. The hostility of these ladies found it more convenient to explain this loyalty, which my misfortunes had perhaps increased as a political cabal, than to attribute it to its natural cause. The persistent animosity this coterie displayed toward me was an example of that which many other circles manifested towards anything that belonged to the former regime. 
the two parties were constantly observing one another, estimating one another's strength and growing more and more actively hostile. It was the misfortune of princes summoned to reign under such conditions that they could not count on the loyalty of their subjects. And this lack of confidence caused them to take steps that still further envenomed matters. Many Chouans came up to Paris. They formed themselves into a separate regiment, entirely composed of former exiles, whom the princes themselves protected. Several former French officers who were in need of a post attempted at once to join. Their request for admission was rejected as undesirable because they had not fought in the English army or in the insurrections in La Vendée or with the Prince of Condé. On being informed of this fact, our officers always went out armed. Fears, which were certainly absurd, were entertained that we were on the eve of a new St. Bartholomew. People took precautions as though it were possible for such atrocities ever to be repeated. Nor was the other party more reassured. The emigrants who had returned to France and whose minds were still filled with recollections of the revolution, imagined constantly that the army and the working classes were on the point of uniting against them. I had an indication of this in connection with an invitation I felt myself obliged to send Monsieur Le Marquis de Riviere. He was aide de camp to the Comte d'Artois and was the only person who had not been ungrateful toward my mother. He had even renewed his expressions of gratitude to me. I sent my valet de chambre to invite him to dinner. Just as my servant arrived at the house of the Marquis, two drunken soldiers were quarreling in the street. He knocked on the door of the apartment and heard exclamations of dismay from within. A man's voice exclaimed, bring me my sword. A woman answered, no, you must not go out. I implore you, do not risk your life. Do you hear them knocking? They have come to assassinate us. Although my servant kept calling from the other side of the door, Day he had only come with a dinner invitation. He could not make himself understood. The commotion was so great that it was half an hour before he managed to explain. At length, the door opened and revealed the wife still holding onto her husband, the husband still grasping his naked sword. And as my name, which had been pronounced several times, did not by any means reassure them, calm was not reestablished until they had fully grasped the fact that it was merely an invitation to dinner. One day, when I was even more worried than usual about the result of my lawsuit, Monsieur Fleury de Chamboulon, a young auditor whom I hardly knew, called on me with a recommendation from the lady-in-waiting of one of my friends. He said to me that France had fallen so low, it was impossible for a man of honor to remain there any longer, and he had therefore decided to go to Elba and take a position in the service of Emperor Napoleon. I urged him to reconsider his decision, which seemed to me an impulsive one, for as the emperor had never met him, he ran the risk of not proving acceptable, but he had made up his mind to carry out his plan. As long as his name would be included among those of the people who had served the emperor, he desired no other recompense or glory. He undertook to deliver various verbal messages for me, but declined to carry anything in writing. I therefore asked him to assure the emperor of my devotion, which his misfortunes had only increased, since I was constantly seeking means which would help me keep my children with me, and since according to what my lawyer said, an authorization in the emperor's handwriting approving my separation from my husband would have removed all possible obstacles. I requested Monsieur Fleury to secure this for me. In regard to any other matter about which I should have wished to communicate with the emperor, I should never have dared confide it to a man whom I scarcely knew and who might have been sent to me to lead me into a trap. This was the only Frenchman who ever set out for Elba, and I am sure he had no secret mission of any kind. Meanwhile, nothing was being done toward executing the treaty of April 11th, which the king had signed. I knew that the emperor, when he left Fontainebleau, had scarcely enough money with him to pay his expenses for a few months. During the few moments I had spent at Rambouillet, I had seen the emperor send him a sum of, I believe, 700,000 francs. 
the rest of his personal funds having been seized and taken back to Paris. He had never thought to make any separate provision for himself, considering his lot bound up with that of France, and he had no private means of any kind for his safety, for his personal protection even. It was absolutely necessary he maintained his bodyguard. The thought that he might shortly find himself obliged to dismiss it because the treaty he had signed was not being carried out was painful to me. I felt myself in a way authorized by my position in France to act on his behalf. But to whom should I address myself? Who had the power to give him what he was so justly entitled to? Monsieur Pozo de Borgo no longer came to my house. Lord Wellington was the English ambassador in Paris. He gave brilliant entertainments, did the honors of the capital, and seemed to be its ruler. He had asked through Madame Recamier to be presented to me at my home. I took advantage of this opportunity in the hope that as a generous enemy, he would perhaps consider its due to his own honor to supervise the execution of trees, which his government was one of the signatories. I received him and on another occasion asked him to dine. Beneath an exterior which at first seemed to lack distinction, it was easy to see that he possessed that pride so characteristically English, based on a knowledge of his personal merits. He had that keenness of glance which indicates greater ability as an observer than as a creative genius, and this caused him to resemble a diplomat rather than a military leader. He spoke to me in a tone of chilly admiration regarding the emperor's great military gifts and alluded with a touch of national pride to the obstinacy with which England had declined to recognize him. He blamed the French government for not having fulfilled the conditions stipulated in the treaty with the emperor and assured me he would again call their attention to the sacred character of their obligations. One evening while I was at the piano, as usual word was brought to me that the clerk of my municipal parish had come to announce that the following morning, the government would take possession of all my property and attach everything I owned. I could not understand the reason for such an astounding act. He begged me to believe his personal devotion to my interests because I had once chanced to do something for a member of his family. I wished to prove this by, infor by informing me what was to take place sufficiently in advance to give me time to remove my most precious belongings to a place of safety. He added that I could verify the truth of his statements by sending someone to the house of Cardinal Fesch where for the last two hours the officials had been engaging in placing the official seal on all the cardinal's property. This I did and found out that the information was true. I therefore hastened to entrust my diamonds to the persons who happened to be present. This was what had become of that perfect tranquility which I had been planning to enjoy after all the storms I had weathered. This was the liberty I had so eagerly desired. The following morning, I received the official announcement that the seals were to be affixed to all the property, furniture, and real estate belonging to the members of the emperor's family. And this in spite of the Treaty of April, which had stipulated that they could keep their property in France. The order was carried out as regards all matters members of the imperial family but on my declaring that i had nothing which belonged to my husband it was admitted that i should not be included on account of the clause covering my special case nevertheless all these violations of the treaty contributed to disturb my peace of mind i began to regret the combination of circumstances which had caused me to remain in my own country and i resolved as soon as my lawsuit was over to withdraw to pregny a little estate I owned on the shores of Lake Geneva. Monsieur de la Bedoyer, whom the emperor had made colonel of an infantry regiment during the last campaign in Germany, had returned to Paris to nurse the wound he had received at Bautzen. His mother was very anxious he should marry Mademoiselle de Chastelux a young and pretty woman. For a long time, he had refused to do so, although I had also asked him to agree, and he declared he valued my advice very highly. Finally, he had given in to us. I have already mentioned that I had declined the services he had come to offer me at the moment of the capitulation of Paris. Following this refusal, in spite of the attachment of his family to the Bourbons, he felt that the moment French territory had been invaded, the emperor's cause became that of the nation, 
and he had proceeded to Fontainebleau, where he had remained till after the emperor's departure. On his return, he had not in any way expressed his adhesion to the new order, had taken no new oath of allegiance, nor sought to hide his opinions, although his regimen had been left him. He expected to be dismissed from the army, constantly quarreling with his wife's family. He preferred to spend his evenings at my home. When I reproached him with thus deserting a young, newly married bride, he told me that it was with her consent in order to avoid disputes with his brother-in-law and that he would be most happy to present her to me after she had had her baby. Although he never expressed it in so many words, his devotion to me and my interests, which he considered were those of his country, had remained unchanged. He went every day to court to attend my trial and came back to report to me what had taken place. The more I tried to calm his indignation against my enemies, the more he was revolted by their injustice towards me. He, like his cousin, Monsieur de Flao, no longer wore the cross of the Legion of Honor. People noticed this and commented on it, attributing it to my influence. I spoke to them about it. They avowed they could no longer regard as a token of distinction, a decoration now lavished on men whose only claim to it was that they held up stagecoaches. Monsieur de la Bidoyere, however, received an order to join his regiment stationed at Chambéry. He made various excuses for tarrying, but at length came to say goodbye to me. In our conversations, he had enjoyed frightening me by describing the rash resolutions he was liable to take on account of the way things were going. So one morning, when I was alone, he asked me, half in jest, half in earnest, what I should say if I were to hear that his regiment had adopted the tricolor cockade and the eagles. Although this seemed like a jest, I explained to him the nature of my fears, which he thus sought to arouse. I told him that one must always feel responsible for the result of one's actions on others and that a man would bitterly regret having committed an act which launched his country on a course that might prove fatal to her. Without listening to my reply, he added, I would not hesitate if I knew anyone skillful enough to assume the leadership of such a movement, but no one would dare so at present. The marshals submit quietly to their country's humiliation because they are enjoying the benefits the emperor secured for them. To be sure, I know one man whom all our hopes are based on, but he holds exaggerated ideas of honor and loyalty. I had a chance to judge Prince Eugène when I acted as his aide-de-camp. He has made up his mind. He will not deviate from the course he has chosen. And in order to be a great man, one must take chances. The emperor is the only one who, with his genius for command, could revive the sentiment of national honor. But his fate is sealed, and he is in retirement. As for me, I can only recognize my humiliation. I again did what I could to calm this state of overexcitement. And when I thought my advice had produced its result, I bade him goodbye. The Duchesse de Bassano was one of my most frequent visitors. She came with her husband, who seldom went out and who perhaps would have feared arousing the suspicions of the police if he had accompanied her more than once a month. Malicious gossip involved him with various political intrigues. Tall, beautiful, with a virginal expression, the Duchesse de Bassano had a calm and sweet face which her happy existence had preserved and which the vivacity of her emotions rendered the more striking. She was keenly touched by our recent misfortunes and did not sufficiently conceal her grief over what had taken place. Her husband was severely criticized. The most serious fault he was accused of was that he had an unfortunate influence over the emperor. People forgot that a genius is his own guide. The Duke's character and gifts were of the kind which best suited the monarch who had placed confidence in him. The closer the Duke came to his master, the more he was obliged to submit to the Emperor's superiority. His weaknesses were too firm an attachment to and too blind an admiration for his sovereign. His principal merit was to have loved and understood a great man. I also saw frequently the Duchesse de Raguse she was separated from her husband, childless, and possessed a large fortune. She could not be happy. Her heart needed some outlet. She overestimated the gifts friendship has to offer and the effects of misfortune. She was loyal in her attachments and frequently cynical in her judgments. People considered her changeable and capricious. 
but that was because wealth cannot cure mistakes of the heart. Monsieur Sosthenes de Rochefoucauld, who knew my respect and esteem for all sincere opinions, even those contrary to my own cause, and who continued to come and see me in spite of political changes, explained to me his conduct in connection with what had recently taken place. I never served the emperor, he said. One day he asked rather naively why so many people were dissatisfied. The king, he declared, had kept everyone at his post. The former army had not been destroyed. Ranks and titles had been respected. He could not understand why there were so many complaints. I answered with a smile, which was slightly malicious. The officers only keep what they have earned legitimately, but you as well as many others who never went outside of Paris are now wearing the double epaulettes of a colonel. Do you think they consider this right and that they are not alarmed about what may happen in the future?